Hello, I'm Jill Goodwin and you'll be hearing shortly from Georgie Knight and we're going to talk about some of the ways that we've tried to create a workable framework in which staff can let go of language in a group situation with students um, and what we mean by holding the space in this context. So Joe Grace had read something that I'd written in my PhD thesis about a session format that I'd tried out with a group of post-16 students when I was still teaching. And she asked if I would say something about it at this conference because she felt it was a really simple idea that um, some delegates here might like to have a try for themselves. Um, it's actually been several years now since I was in the classroom, so um, I've asked Georgie along to join me and to um, share her experience, which is more current than mine. So I'm just going to explain what I used to do and why, and then um, share some of the issues and challenges that came up for me in running the sessions. And then I'll hand over to Georgie, who'll describe how she adapted the format to sort to suit her particular learners. So the original idea for the sessions came from my discomfort actually over the amount of language that was going on in my classroom. And I just wanna be clear here, um, I'm not talking about people sitting around, um, you know, talking about what they had for dinner last night or what was on the telly. Um, I was working in a fantastic school at the time and the language being used in the classroom was definitely very purposeful and respectful but nevertheless I often wondered what might it feel like for our students to be surrounded by this ongoing sound that possibly had little or no meaning for them. Now we were using intensive interaction as our approach to communication with students on a one-to-one -one basis but in general once we came together as a group we tended to revert to using words um, even in the most sensory of sessions, it might be a minimal amount, it might just be simply something logistical that needed sorting or in terms of praising or uh, narrating a student's progress. But um, I decided I wanted to try and explore whether we could establish a session framework where we didn't fall back on speech and where our focus was solely on being together as a group in what I thought might be a potentially more equitable space for the students. Um, just in case you do try this out and you've got uh, a very mixed ability group, um, just to mention here that I did have one student in my class at this time when I first tried these out, who I would now use the term um, profound and multiple barriers to learning rather than profound and multiple learning difficulties because she was non-verbal but she had a reasonable receptive vocabulary um, and I could see that this session wasn't suited to her needs and abilities so I arranged a separate one-to-one -one activity for her outside the classroom so you know those are the kinds of decisions you'd need to make when if, if you do attempt this yourselves. Um, the next thing I did was to put a big do not disturb sign on the door. Um, obviously I chose a time when there were no scheduled nursing or other medical interventions and when it was reasonable to ask that visitors didn't interrupt us. Um, and then we would, um, all of my students were wheelchair users at this time, we would gather in a tight circle with the staff um, regularly interspersed within that circle and I would begin the session with three dings on the Tibetan tingsha bells, you know, those metal discs on a cord, um, like Indian chimes I used to call them, but the correct name is Tibetan tingsha bells. Um, and at this point, staff would silently watch and wait, um, only vocalizing in response to movements or sounds of the students. And then after perhaps 10 to 15 minutes, sometimes longer, the session would be drawn to a close with three notes on the bells again. And basically that's it, that's the format. Now, Dave Hewitt describes intensive interaction as the process of two people becoming engaged with each other and sharing an, 
and sharing and exchanging a flow of behaviour. And I think that's what we were trying to achieve, but in this group context, to become engaged with each other and to share a flow of behaviour. However, I think we need a different theoretical framework than intensive interaction because of it being about a group rather than a pair. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. But nevertheless, we were applying some of the basic principles of this approach in terms of how we were responding. Our first impressions as a group of staff were really that the sessions were quite magical. There was a real energy and intensity to them and we definitely saw some students uh, recognise and delight in the unified responses that they were getting for their sounds and movements and we saw an increase in their involvement as a result. And given this was quite an experimental format that we were trialling, we were all quite excited by the sessions actually and over time we really felt that some students came to recognise the session cue and that they knew that this was a bit of time and space where they could lead and where they would really be witnessed and heard and that's the essence of what the sessions were about. Um, so I want to say now something about my experience of leading the sessions and this is where I want to dig into this idea of holding the space. So we were suddenly in close proximity to others in a strange new setup without language to kind of oil the wheels, certainly for us linguistic beings. Um, so I think the, the setup had the potential to feel quite confronting and uncomfortable. Um, it was an experimental format, so I really wanted to get staff on board with me and I suppose I had an investment in the session feeling successful um, and this gave me a sense of pressure and responsibility, which probably was um, not an ideal state of mind to be in. And when our learners were vocalising or clearly engaged, then there was a really easy shared focus amongst staff. Um, and in those moments, of course, I could relax and feel really comfortable with what was happening. But inevitably, I think with a group of learners with profound and multiple learning difficulties, there were times when it appeared that not much was happening at all. And that's when it can become much more challenging. Um, I really wanted to role model being relaxed, being fully present warmly available, um, totally comfortable with any or no offerings that students made. Um, but in reality, in those first sessions particularly, my mind was in overdrive as I was questioning what I was doing, what the staff thought we were doing, um, particularly if we sat for a few minutes apparently doing nothing together. So I think the idea of PMLD time is which, uh, that's a phrase I used to hear quite a lot um, before, is, is quite relevant here because our perception of time is hugely subjective and I can remember how interminable even just two to three minutes felt uh, when I was in that uncomfortable self-conscious mind racing kind of headspace um, and I think there's a compulsion when you feel like that to actually try and make something happen or even um, occasionally I would foreclose things, you know, I would round up the session because I've decided that we've all had enough now. Um, that, that kind of compulsion can feel really overwhelming. It's just anything to get away from that uncomfortable silence. But of course, if you're feeling self-conscious, then by definition, your focus is on yourself and not on the experience of your learners, which is not what we want in this instance. Um, so for me, I came to see the sessions um, as being an opportunity to try and push our tolerance of stillness and silence and trying to make more space for our learners to come to the fore. Um, we've really got to get into that PMLD mindset, that time frame and focus on keeping the space open for them to take the lead when they're ready. And as we already know, you know, it might take lots of time and repeated exposure for them to recognise that this opportunity is there for them and then to make use of it. So that's really what I mean by the idea of holding the space and 
I think it can feel a bit at odds with our usual, more usual role of trying to actively facilitate learning opportunities. And I see it almost like the staff forming a protective barrier around the group and collectively trying to sort of hold off distractions, the compulsion to move on, the pressure for action that we typically react to in order just for that relatively short time to just keep the invitation open for our students to express themselves. So as well as managing the discomfort when not a lot seem to be happening, I think um, lots of questions come up with this kind of group. Um, even when students are actively participating, like what do you do when you've got widely differing energy levels amongst your students? How do you make sure that space is held open for your quietest ones? Um, what do you do when more than one learner is trying to hold court? Um, you know, these are the instances where you need to work out strategies, potentially as a staff team, by reflecting on what happens in the sessions. I know that I had a lot of questions, a lot of questions came up for me when I read the work of Colwyn Trevathan, um, his stuff on primary and secondary into subjectivity in infants. I really wondered what capacity did those learners who were operating at very early developmental levels, um, students who you might say were at the stage of only primary um, and not secondary into subjectivity, what capacity did they have for group experience? And did this type of session have any value for them even? So this is what I'm getting at when I say that the sessions need a different theoretical framework than intensive interaction because you're not tailoring your responses to just the needs of one individual. And you may even be cutting across some aspects of best practice in intensive interaction. So. If that's the case for your particular students, then you'll need to decide whether this is even a helpful format to use or whether one-to-one -one intensive interaction is a more valuable approach on its own. Um, I really don't have the answers to these questions, but I think they're worth asking because um, I think this is quite a complex area of human experience. And I do think there's something about a sense of groupness, um, possibly the idea of belonging that's worth exploring in this way. And I've yet to find a theoretical model that satisfactorily explains it all for me. Um, but probably uh, Victor Turner, who was an anthropologist writing in the 1960s, his notion of communitas probably comes the closest for me. Um, and he describes communitas as a communion of equal individuals in direct, immediate and total confrontation. And um, although the word confrontation sounds quite hard there, I think letting go of language can actually be quite confronting, certainly for us um, linguistic beings. And um, well, I guess I'm making quite a leap there by applying Victor Turner's work to this very different context, but it's just something I'm very interested in. So I'm going to stop waffling now and hand over to Georgie. Um, I just want to finish by saying that even though it's some years since I first led these type of sessions, they really were pivotal to the work that I've been involved in since, including my recent work with Oily Cart Theatre Company, actually, um, because I think the notion of holding the space, particularly when you're working with individuals who may appear to be very passive or unengaged. Um, it's a really important one. And I've become very interested in how the arts can offer us um, their own holding forms that can enable us to be together more comfortably without language. I have put a link to my PhD thesis in Joe Grace's um, conference resource bank if you are interested to read any more about where I've gone with it since. Um, but that's it from me and I'm going to hand over now to Georgie Knight. Thanks very much for listening. Hello, I'm Georgie and I'm going to share with you some of the things I've learned from running this type of communication session and how I extended these and looked at new ways to encourage my teenage learners and my young adult learners, ways to develop their peer friendships and relationships. 
So it's important to me um, to develop a structure of these sessions to create an established routine which elicits anticipation. So the way I went about this was selecting a cue and the cue I chose was the African drum, the djembe. I decided on this because I felt like the drum held the space and it was a really good tool for building up anticipation as well as sounding lovely. <laughs> So we'd all come round with the sound of the drum being played and we'd all get into position. So I quickly noticed that sometimes some of our guys might have been waiting for a few moments until we all joined or we were all ready or someone would come in with low energy levels. The djembe was a good tool to use the sound, the rhythmical sound of the drum to use percussion onto the young person's arms and legs and feet. Um, and it really enlivened our young people ready for the session. So the other thing that we noticed quickly was obviously the beautiful sound of the djembe being played um, and that sudden stop, no sound whatsoever. And it really alerted the guys to something that was going to happen, something was gonna happen next. I just wanted to add here, I was playing the djembe, the drum, I'm no musician, in fact I'm far from it, and it took me completely out of my comfort zone to actually play a rhythm on this drum. But I did it, and I'd encourage you, if you're like me, just give it a go. The, the rewards of what you see from the young people really are magical. So, we were all round in our circle, the, the drum had finished playing, what was next? So something I recognise for myself is the importance of self-identity and a part of that is your name and I decided that I wanted to know who was there in the group so I selected a small drum, just one that um, everyone could tap out a rhythm of their name, their name was said out loud and this was passed to every member of the group, uh, students and uh, members of staff so we could find out who was there and their name could be said out loud. Next part of the routine was down to the students. So I wanted them to know this was about them. So I rung a small bell and simply said, control is over to you. So that was the established part of the routine that I used week in, month in, <laughs> month out and even years. But it was the part in the middle that really showed me so much more about our learners. Um, about how they communicate and actually the, the possibility for some learners to for that peer-to-peer -peer communication if developmentally they were at that stage. So it was important again that we bought, I really looked outside the box and thought how, how does this happen and something that I saw as well was the partner the partnership between some of our other practices for example the Sherbourne practice, the sensory sessions and one aspect of the communication through touch session for me um, became really important and really showed some different things that we could build into the, the group communication. So yes, uh, they all have different emphasis, um, but I felt like there was components that would, com uh, that would complement each other. Like I said, the communication through touch part, I'll explain that in a moment when I talk about something that a couple of the peers did together. So positioning, again, I felt really important in the group um, and looking not just who you're going to sit next to and who, which member of staff was going to be with you, but whether your best position was in your wheelchair, your supportive wheelchair on the floor or in a stander. Because when I looked at my guys, I recognised that the importance that actually, where is their energy being used up? Um, the focus of communication rather than them feeling they had to adjust and manage their posture throughout the session. So, all that in place, I really started to agree with Jill. Uh, I really recognise what Jill has said about that, protecting the space, protecting the session from interruptions. Our guys, our students, they're out of control. They have no control over so much aspect of their lives. So much is done to them. And I wanted to keep this place, this space for them, um, really precious. So it was just for them. So eliminating any interventions was really important. I was very lucky. Uh, there I've 
very I had lots of different opportunities to use different environments and one of my favourites environments that I was able to use was the school hall. Um, I loved the acoustics because they were very different and the vocal sounds were really enhanced. It also gave opportunity for the learners to hear the drum being played down the school corridors as they came in and approached the hall and they came in, the doors were open and in they came. So obviously it gave me many opportunities to observe my learners as they came in. And on a few occasions, I'd be able to see some of the guys would come in and actually communicate, not today, no thank you, this isn't for me. And as this was a communication session, I really wanted to respect and, and say, I hear you, I hear what you're saying, and have them, they, so they didn't have to join us. Uh, I recognised quickly that if you really try to persuade somebody that this is the session you are doing, that that's, that's not going to work and that's not what the session is about. And it is, it is better to have one less member of staff than it is trying to persevere with, this, with a young person that clearly is communicating not for me today. So that balance between leaving the open space and knowing when intervene, to intervene. Um, Jill spoke about holding the space um, and the, the importance of this. And I reflected on the fact that it's okay it's okay to be quiet, it's okay just to be still, just to be present, because it isn't just, 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 <laughs> there's always something happening and if we really try and just trust ourselves and to hold back, uh, we will see some magical things happening for our young guys. In an ideal world, everything would be student-led, but that doesn't happen um, in PMLD world. They need a responsive adult that knows their communicative behaviours. Um, and with the knowledge of our young adults, we used, we used this and their repertoire. Um, we fed this back to them. We replicated their vocal sounds, their gestures. And we use this as a tool to invite them back into the session if they were, if they felt that if they were quieter and we'd given them that pause, but actually we needed to be there to, to be able to facilitate that, for them to re-engage in the group, to invite them back in. So as I said on some of the meetings with my teams, we talked a lot about don't assume that quiet is not participating and to think about uh, when to try and entice the young people, when to support, when to be more involved, or when just to trust yourselves and to trust them that they, when they're ready, they will re-engage and there's things already still happening the whole time. Um, an example I want to share with you about peer-to-peer relationships and acknowledgement of their peers is one of my students um, was having was having a bit of a moan in the morning and uh, she was letting us know that she wasn't particularly happy that day uh, but we came into the group and recognized that yes she was going to accept to be there the the bell was rung and she commute started to communicate and she had a bit of a moan and through those pauses her peers were responding and what was really interesting, I, I sort of sat back myself to observe her and two other peers. She would vocalise, they would vocalise joyfully in response and one of them clapped and tapped her feet on, on her foot plates. And what was, became very apparent was the fact that that her mood was shifted as a group, as particularly these two peers, were it was working to to lift her up and to shift her mood, and that's exactly what happened. It reminded me again of one of the reasons I wanted to build these sessions, why I wanted to have um, an opportunity for our young people to feel like. Have you ever seen teenagers in a park and they all get together and they're all friends? and they're all moaning, they're all joyful. They're there just to be together because that's what a friend is. A peer, a friend, is someone that you want to have fun with. And I really wanted to put this into some sessions um, in our Learners Week. 
So also with this in mind again, creating more opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer relationships and looking at who is going to respond well with who. So I stopped again. I thought, right, how can we actually pause within this session? So halfway through, I introduced ringing another bell and through our knowledge of our learners, um, I would pair up some students um, to go and work with one adult and with a peer that we'd acknowledge that there was they were at that stage and they might have shown a, a willingness to communicate with. So I want to say here that obviously with that break, that pause within the group, this did break um, the communication, the, the conversation so that responsive team member to actually re-engage, re-initiate this was something that was very important as well. Um, I recall one of the young ladies, um, it became very, very apparent that uh, she really wanted a one-to-one -one conversation with this young man. And obviously we made sure that this happened. And <laughs> it was very quickly obvious the bell was rung. She started to whoop, clap her hands and look over to her peer um, as they moved together to their space. <laughs> and it was absolutely magical. On these occasions, the adult didn't need to intervene and re-engage. They were there. She was there already. So that was one of my magical moments, seeing these two together. Um, as well, it was something that I noticed that within a classroom setting, this was actually transferred over there to there as well, where they'd actually communicate into the classroom. And this was transferred from this from this session. I spoke about earlier the communication through touch and what I'd learned from some of those sessions into this session. So when I looked at the peer to peer, I recognised two of my peers actually love foot massages and they love their feet being touched or pressed together. So what I did was these pairs, I took them over and I took their shoes and socks off. They were positioned in their wheelchairs comfortably and uh, I placed one of the learners feet on top of the other feet quite shocking really and the young yeah, the young adult that had his feet on the top started to play out a rhythmical pattern a rhythmical beat onto his peers feet um, first of all he looked a bit startled then his arms started to extend his face started to light up a smile happened and you started to see him started to giggle started to laugh and the more he did started to laugh and giggle a little bit, his peer paused and then started to drum out a faster beat, pausing. And by the end, within a few moments, uh, the young man that was having the percussion on his feet was in belly laughter. And that will stay with me forever. It was beautiful. So transferring that knowledge that I'd had from my classroom into the communication session really led to that peer-to-peer -peer opportunities to communicate together, which was wonderful. <laughs> so um, over the years, like I said, I've been very, very blessed over the years to be able to have lots of young people come in for different communication groups. Um, so the structure was always the same, but we could change elements of that middle part. Um, and some of the elements that were changed is when I was joined by ambulant learners. Now, this really did change the dynamics um, and the energy levels of the group, having some PMLD learners that were ambulant. Um, I looked at ways that would obviously make sure that they were included. Um, they'd get up, they'd go and sit next to someone, or they'd just go and sit to the other side of the room. So it was looking at different ways that I could really invite them in and get them involved. And again, as I've said before, that that responsive communication partner of the adult was always key to this. They'd go over, they'd initiate something. We'd know the repertoire of that young person's communication. We'd get to know them and invite them back in. But also I put out some of their, maybe they like to sit, they had a favourite chair to sit on, a bean bag, and I'd move that and I'd make sure there was more opportunities for them to come and sit wherever they wanted to come and sit. And I found that this worked, uh, this worked really well. Again, it was very obvious as we did these sessions, as I've said, that need for that responsive communication partner, the one that's reliable, that's us. Um, 
and that was probably one of the key things that um, I always sort of train, make sure my staff understand that and the team understand that because to, to have the best communication session to give over control to our young people, it's that responsive adult, particularly if the young people are not developmentally at that stage when they're ready for that peer to peer relationship. Um, so that adult relationship is really important. Um, if our guys don't get that feedback, um, what I observed was the connections do fade. Um, so we are needed. We are needed. I'd like to thank you very much for listening and hope some of what I've talked about is useful for things that you do.